We continue now, my dear friends, with our reflections. And I move now into our reflections for Good Friday, the Passion of our Lord. Now, I'm going to do this again a little different. For the Passion of the Lord, we will read from uh, the Gospel according to St. John, and it begins with uh, the 18th chapter and the first verse all the way to the 19th chapter, verse uh, 42. And that's a long Gospel. I'm not going to read. It's a narration again. Hear the story again. Be like children of God and go and listen to the story, how it happens. I would like just to simply point out at this stage, my dear friends, uh, part of the reflections that I'm going to do is that we see that uh, with Holy Thursday, we read from John chapter 13, the beginning of the Book of Glory, verses 1 to 15. And then at uh, what he called this here, with the Good Friday, we will read from the Gospel according to St. John, uh, the, the Passion of Our Lord from chapter 18 to 19. And then when we move also into Easter Sunday, we read again from the Gospel according to St. John chapter 20. There is a good bit of the readings taken from the Gospel according to St. John in the Easter Triduum. Now, the other Gospels will come into play also, uh, as I've, I tried to show also with Monday, Thursday, as far as the washing of the feet in John, but there is also the institution of the Holy Eucharist. For Easter, we will read also from the other Gospels. They will have their versions of the East, Easter account, the, re the resurrection of the Lord, the narrative on the resurrection of the Lord, the story of the resurrection of the Lord. But we focus here the three days. There's a lot from the Gospel according to St. John. I'd like to stress here, my dear friends, that John is a little different. We have to recall also that the Gospel according to St. John is written much, much later on already after Matthew, Mark, and Luke were already into the second century, maybe a good two decades into the second century. And therefore, the spiritual master of uh, the school of thought of John, uh, the evangelist, uh, or rather John the Apostle, coming now being written by the evangelist, is very much there and strong. It is a long, profound and reflection already. They've reflected a lot of what is happening on how Jesus suffered, died, and rose again from the dead. The next that I would like to point out in our passion narrative, my dear friends, is I would like to start off by use, by remembering how the first Christians, Jewish Christians, we're trying to make sense of all of that was ha that had happened. If this is already into the second century and a good uh, already more than coming to a hundred years after Jesus had, was here in this earth, lived, suffered, died, and resurrected, and has gifted the Holy, the Holy Spirit to all who follow and these now, uh, in the school of John, they are gifted with the Holy Spirit. They have received the indwelling, let me use that term now, of the Holy Spirit. And they are doing their mission and spreading what they have learned, what they have heard, what they have now received. They are passing on. So, in their trying to understand this, there is the book of the prophet Isaiah that they use. And I've mentioned that. They've used uh, for our gospel reading for the Passion Sunday. I said that would be Isaiah 42. And then for the readings during the weekdays of this Holy Week, Mon uh, Holy Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'll be reading from chapter 49 and then chapter 50. And then for Good Friday, we read from Isaiah 52. And I would like to start off from there with Isaiah 52 to 53. 
See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man, so shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall, justly, shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils of the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and will and win pardon for their offenses. This, my dear friends, is the great, as they would so, say it now, the suffering song one of the suffering songs of the book of Isaiah, found in the book of Isaiah. It's a suffering song. It's already called a song these days. It's the suffering servant. And I use that for our starters, and it is a beautiful song. If we were to sing it, if we were to chant it, how I wish, how I wish we could chant it also at, at Mass. But we take note, first of all, especially these days, my dear friends, coming, coming from a lockdown, coming from uh, the coronavirus, suffering. It's called Jesus is the Suffering Servant, and we use the suffering, song, suffering songs from Isaiah. Suffering, what does suffering mean? And some would say, some have come to me and spoken how they suffered because of the coronavirus and how some of them have died in their family. And they said that suffering re leads 
suffering leads to holiness, how suffering can make us holy. And now that suffering making us holy, of course, it's in the Lord, it's in Jesus Christ. The suffering here also, my dear friends, I would like to say, if we were to extend that aside from that idea of holiness and it is suffering in Jesus Christ, we also would ask ourselves, why, why do I have to suffer? What, what, what are the things wrong or the sins, the personal sins that I have done? that I suffer because of that. Now, let us not become masochistic about this, but the whole idea to this is that we know that because of personal sin, when sin happens, we suffer. And hence, we like to think of how do, we, how do we alleviate this suffering. If we extend that again a little further, we have to understand that there is community suffering. There is people suffering, uh, the lockdowns, the suffering that we had. It was not just me alone, individually, personally, but in family, our neighborhood, cities, countries, the whole world had to stop. We suffered because of that. And one could ask, there's the question, of course, of why, but then more important is what is going on? What is this all about? And we do know that such suffering is not the first time that the whole world, all the peoples have ever experienced. You can go down back in history and they will tell you countless uh, stories documented of how nations and peoples have suffered in various ways and in many ways. And the big difference for us is because of media and social media, how not only is it historically documented, but how we're able to put it on YouTube, on Facebook, and all of those other forms of uh, uh, media that we have on television, etc. And we see what suffering can be, what it is all about. And we ask ourselves what, it's, what this is all about. What can be done with regard to this? And if I may use the term, how we are suffering as one. We do not suffer alone. There is no such thing as alien suffering. When one suffers, everybody else suffers. Somebody else suffers. They may not acknowledge that it is with them, but we suffer together. There is no such thing as alien suffering. Interesting, is it not? That there is somebody who suffers with us and suffers for us. We also move into the direction, my dear friends, in senseless forms of suffering. And not that there continues to in this world violence and war and it's not the first time it's also recorded history and even we count 2,000 plus years now even before the counting of the 2,000 plus before Christ before the common era, era as they would say now different wars and different forms of violence that there is in this world and you know how sometimes in fact you know that violence itself the form of violence there is a certain holiness to it that when it is done to certain people that there is a certain holiness to it the violence and the sacre rene girard what do we do? What have people done regarding that down the ages? What do we do about it? What is it all about? And here, my dear friends, in the Gospel according to St. John, how he uses the suffering servant, the songs, he says, See, my servant shall prosper. 
he shall be raised high and greatly exalted. And there, my dear friends, I would like to use that image of being raised high and exalted. That is not the first time that we hear that. And in the Gospel according to St. John, being raised high and being exalted when you are raised high, that is very much St. John. Of course, automatically, I hope we are thinking already that Jesus is raised high on the cross. He is on His throne on the cross, and on that cross, He is exalted. You are watching ATVN Philippines. Emmanuel, the God with us who saves. But we have a good bit of that already, my dear friends, do we not? I have mentioned that already, and in some of our readings, daily readings, and we go back to the book of uh, uh, the book of Numbers and the book of uh, yes, the book of Numbers, where the people of Israel were crossing the desert already uh, and journeying towards the the promised land, and then they didn't like the food that they were eating. They didn't like let's put it in general the suffering that they were going through in the desert. Uh, and then eating the type of food that they had, and they complained to Moses. And because of that complaint, God heard it and sent serpents. And they were bitten by the serpents and they died. And then they rush back to Moses and they say, We have sinned. We are wrong. Please tell God that we are sorry. And so what did they do? They made serpent staffs and raised it high. And then the instructions were, if anybody is bitten by the seraph serpents that are there, let them just look at that staff that is made in the form of a serpent. And when you look at it, they will be healed there is the first good indication my dear friends of what it means to be raised up there and exalted healing takes place at the passion of the lord when he is raised up and exalted healing takes place Jesus heals our suffering. That is a very important understanding for us on Good Friday. When He is raised up and exalted, He heals our suffering. By His suffering on the cross, He heals our suffering. Maybe, quote-unquote, not immediately, instantly. If you wish, in the history of this world, the human condition, there will always be other forms, new forms of suffering. Regardless, when that cross is raised and Christ suffers on the cross, anybody who comes to Him and asks for healing, he, she will be healed. So on Good Friday, my dear friends, one of the prayers that we ought to be bringing with us is that of the prayer of, Lord, have mercy on me. And when we say, Lord, have mercy on me, it is also stating, Lord, heal me. Mercy of God heals. When God forgives, He heals. Remember, in many a story, the Gospel according to St. John, and even in the other Gospels, 
when Jesus heals, he forgives. The two always come together. That is why at the good at the Good Friday ceremonies, celebrations, the reenactment of the passion, the hearing of the story again, the way of the cross, my dear friends, especially the reformed way of the cross or the new way of the cross so given to us by Benedict the 16th, may he rest in peace in the glory of God. Do it. Now is the time. In Filipino, ang daan ng cruz. Now is the time. Uh, it's interesting if I may make a side comment that at the beginning of uh, Lent, Ash Wednesday, I already saw some people doing the way of the cross and I wanted to tell them, uh, wait, not yet, not yet. The story is not yet there. <laughs> and if we are again children listening to the story of God, follow the story. And now is the time. Now is the time to do the way of the cross. Or now is the time to follow the story by the way of the cross. And here we will see Jesus Christ suffering and His suffering heals. As we see the suffering of Jesus Christ and that heals us, ask for the mercy of Jesus Christ. He will heal us. You are watching ATVN Philippines. Emmanuel, the God with us who saves. Ah. If I may ask, uh, add already, because as it is, it is all that is written here also. This is not just personal or communal healing. This also has to do with healing of my friends, healing of my enemies, healing of those who are suffering because that they are at the point of death, healing of those who are suffering violence and there's so much violence going on around the world especially of women and children of those refugees and migrants all over the world and healing of those who are at war that they stop the war already and all of those victims these harmless victims because of these wars we suffer we ask the lord for mercy and to heal us of these things and if I may say so already my dear friends if it has not yet come to our attention it should my dear friends in terms of what look that some people make war as their practice of politics that from time to time they will wage a war because they want to exercise their ideology or philosophy. That is suffering too. They suffer because of that way of thinking and others suffer because of the wars that they conduct. That the Lord may heal us of that. Heal us of all of this suffering, violence and wars. There is also the other aspect, my dear friends, in terms of this being raised up on the cross and being exalted on the cross. The suffering servant on the cross, my dear friends, will die. And yet, on the third day, so he dies Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday, he will rise again and he conquers death. My dear friends, what we are also talking about here when we read the Passion of the Lord according to St. John, Jesus Christ conquers death and everything else that has to do with evil. And that, my dear friends, too, 
is very important for us to understand. For the greatest of all, shall we say, I use the word conundrum, <laughs> I'd like to use that word, but the greatest of all that which is uh, scary, which is for others they'd like to spurn, coming from Isaiah, the suffering servant saw, others which they do not want to pay attention to, is that we are mortal. We will all die. Our life on this earth ends. That human condition we have to face. We have to accept. We have to be aware about. We will all die. That would be the greatest of all sufferings all human beings will experience. Or perhaps have experienced in the sense that we have seen people die before us in whatever situation or condition. But once again, the raising up of Jesus he is raised up on that cross, and on that cross, He saves. He will not remain on that cross. He will be taken down, wrapped, put in a tomb, and He will rise again on the third day. And by His rising again, triumphs over death, conquers all of evil, and from here on, there is no suffering, no violence, no Satan or devil out there who can withstand this. It's all done. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And He tells us, I do this saving act for you, so that in the end, all your sufferings at death will end because now I give you new life. So his passion and death is a saving passion and death. Christ saves us on the cross. On the cross, he assumes all of that suffering unto themselves, and it ends there. And if you wish, part of that loving, part of that I mentioned on Holy Thursday, that mandatum, that you love one another, you love one another unto death, you love one another in suffering and unto death. Once again, we're not being masochistic here. No, we are accepting the fact that there is a lot of suffering and we have to go through it. Even before that, my dear friends, I'll use another term, two, other two terms with S's. We have to strive and struggle through life. That is a part of being human, the striving and the struggling. And in the striving and in the struggling, it will all come to an end because of our mortality. But not for naught, my dear friends. Because we remember, we celebrate, and we believe in Jesus. And because of that, He will raise us up. His suffering on the cross saves. I'll move to another aspect here, my dear friends, because there is the part in the Passion narrative of St. John where this is all happening during the Passover. Now, there is a good bit of, how would I say, exchange, religious exchange, because I did mention to you already that there is the social, cultural, religious uh, atmosphere 
uh, going on between the Jewish Christians now and the Jews who would like to remain uh, in their Judaism. We are in the second century already and there is the exchange between them. And here our gospel writing writer is telling us that Jesus Christ now is the new Passover. That there is the experience of the Passover Mosaic Passover, but now Jesus Christ is the new Moses, is the new, new Passover, and now we have new life, a new life in Jesus Christ. That by His death, this is the new Passover, there is a new life. And it's not easy to simply say that in front of, quote-unquote, your opposition or the tradition that you would like to, shall we say, move on from. I wanted to say move away from. No, let's use the terms. Uh, we are continuing from that tradition, but there are parts also that we are discontinuing because we are now in a new life, a new Passover in Jesus Christ. So that Cutting off, there is that part of cutting off. We reach a certain point that we would like to, we have continued from our many traditions from the Old Testament, from our Jewish brothers and sisters, but there is that part now where we say we move to a new Passover, to a new life in Jesus Christ. And that, my dear friends, again, it's not easy to say that we would like to respect our Jewish brothers and sisters, but we move also to our, from our Jewish heritage into a Jewish Christian way of proceeding. Our Jewish Christian religion, our Jewish Christian new Passover, new life, because it is now with Jesus Christ. And to state that in our world today, my dear friends, that we have a new Passover, a new life, it also means we are opening up to many other cultures and many other peoples, different races, different colors, different, uh, shall we say, geographies and topographies and uh, if I may say so their way of celebrating meals are different and yet we would like to say that we would like to take the bread and the wine just like Jesus did and now it will be it will be taken it will be blessed it will be broken and we share it with you now and this is the prophetic gesture that comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. And let it be now our prophetic gesture. As we remember this, we celebrate, we believe, and we pass it on. What we have received from Jesus, we pass it on now to other peoples, to other cultures, to other lands. And this, my dear friends, into our world, into our times, is not easy to do without bias, without hate. Perhaps, if I may say so, let them, quote-unquote, even treat us with such bias and hate, but we will respond to them with love. Because that is what it means to be raised up on the cross and exalted on the cross. He was spurned. He was betrayed. He was abandoned. Nevertheless, that was all part of the story. He still rose from the dead and gave us the gift of new life, new Passover, a new creation. 
Jesus Christ is our Passover. Jesus Christ is our new life. There is also one final aspect that I would like to add as far as our gospel reading is concerned. In the gospel according to St. Matthew, when we read the Passion the, the, for Good Friday, after this, Joseph of Arimathea secretly, a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body and bound it with burial clothes, cloths rather, burial cloths, along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, day for the tomb was close by. I just find it, and I, it, I find it quite intriguing and perhaps mysterious for that matter, and let's use the term strange in the widest sense of the word, my dear friends, that uh, first of all, uh, what I mean, the whole narrative, the, it was so long in terms of a trial and how we have to remember our Lord Jesus Christ at a trial and then He's crucified, and then uh, his expiration, his death, is, are, there are no words explaining uh, what happened, how he died. This is not like uh, G Jesus Christ of uh, Mel Gibson, where there's so much drama and emotion, etc. No, it, when we read the narrative, there is no such. The greater part of the narrative has to do with a trial. And then he dies, he, uh, he gives up his spirit, he, or the proper term, it's, it's gospel according to St. John. He hands over his spirit. Uh, let me not get into that now. We'll have to look at a lot of things again, and including the suffering servant songs. And going back also to, to the Old Testament, he hands over his spirit. And that's it. But the great part of that is there's so much of, of the trial that we have to endure and listen to. But alas, uh, let me not burden you with that. It's just, I just find that rather mysterious. And perhaps I say that because please don't, don't think that we have all the answers already to every each point, etc., etc. If the writer of the gospel, it took them with his community and school of thought, uh, John's school of thought in the second century, and we read it now, there's so much to be, to be understood and looked at, and it took them decades to, to come to a, an understanding and writing, write it this way, so much the more for us now. And, and yet, not to say that we, we don't have quote-unquote hope, no. It is for us to learn more. It is a teachable moment, as my professor would say. And it is a grace-filled moment, as Father Arevalo would say. Take it. Don't let it go. See where it takes you at prayer. And here, part of the mystery, I would say, at the end of our Gospel reading, we have two men, Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus. Nicodemus goes back to what you call this, uh, chapter 3 of John, uh, where he goes and sees Jesus at night. Uh, he's a Pharisee, remember? And we have here Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. Again, another Joseph. And they are the ones who take care, take the body, and bring him to the tomb. I scratch my head with regard to this because when you look at the other Gospels, 
it's the women, correct? Now here, I, here we go again. Uh, we said that there are similar, it's a basic account, but then in terms of the details, there are differences. And as I said, this is the gospel according to St. John, written much later on and after profound reflection and also in relation and in response to the different pressures pressures, remember my reflections regarding pressures, the philosophies, and also the theologies and cultures of those times. And here, and that part of the difference, we have two men, and it's two men, a Joseph and a Nicodemus. A Nicodemus who once was, would see him in the, in the night, and is the one who buries him in the night again, and Jesus will be the light. I am the light of the world, the resurrection. We have a Joseph here, remember? And we know also in terms of the infancy narrative, it is a Joseph who takes care of him as a child, as he grows up. And now at his burial, it is another Joseph who takes him with Nicodemus, his body, to the tomb. Interesting, is it not? Beautiful, is it not? And if Joseph, his name means, and God will add, what is being added here? From the beginning, it is a Joseph, his foster father. In the end, when he dies, his body with Nicodemus is brought to the tomb by a Joseph. I would dare say, my dear friends, as I close my reflections with regard to what you call this, our Good Friday, the Passion of the Lord, for us to look at that. It's a long gospel reading, and I started off by telling you using the Suffering Servant Song and that idea of suffering, what it means. And then I told you about that on that cross, Jesus Christ heals and saves and Jesus Christ is the new Passover and the new life but a good way of ending it part of the narrative is that we have two men who brings Jesus to the tomb imagine yourself my dear friends that you are with these two men and you are bringing Jesus to the tomb and burying him oh Do you remember how you have brought family or friends or perhaps somebody you don't know because you just simply want to console and condole whoever else is bringing the significant person to their burial? What type of quote-unquote dignity is so given? What type of, let's call it, rituals or rites that are used so that the person is laid to rest? Here Jesus Christ is put in a tomb with his mirror, mirror and aloes. And I scratch my head with regard to that as far as St. John is concerned and part of the rites and the rituals, if I may give you some ingredients already in terms of you bringing Jesus to the tomb, uh, is that of and aloes that goes back to wedding symbols in the gospel according to St. John. Those types of spices, mm -hmm. myrrh and aloes, they are wedding symbols. So what, what is going on here? What is St. John doing here? Of course, I want to explain it and tell you a lot, good bit of this, but it, that is why I end our reflections as far as the Good Friday Passion narrative is concerned with you. 
because we have the, the Annan Cruz, the way of the cross, etc. But remember, it ends that Jesus Christ is buried. It ends there as far as the way of the cross and the passion is concerned. Be there. What do you do? What do you do? What can you imagine yourself being there? And what rights do you have? Now, my dear friends, it is not for us to create new rights because uh, I do know that in the Philippine sea scene, there will be a lot, uh, there will be processions again everywhere, uh, prayers uh, uh, for each station as they do the way of the cross uh, citywide in many a city, in many a town, etc. All of that, yeah. all the way to the when Jesus Christ is raised on the cross, etc. And we do our form of penitentia, our penitence in all of that. Is it not so? In the Philippine scene, in the Philippine rituals, that is how we do the, the passion. But I would like to add here and add and end the reflection in terms of how about at the tomb? What happens at the tomb? Now, it's not for us, like I said, to start on new rituals, no, because some would, you know, would want to have a Santo Inchero that the body is there and then people start putting on candles, etc. Uh, that is not the way it happened in the way the Gospel of John narrates it. No, all we have, it's a quiet scene. Two men bringing the body, having wrapped him with burial cloths, with the aloes and mirror, and then bringing it to the tomb, which was close by to the mountain at Calvary. And they were the ones who laid him in the tomb. It's a very quiet, simple scene. And it's at night. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They are anticipating and waiting. They are looking forward. It is a pointing towards. So my recommendation for your reflection is go there. Do that quietly. With no lights, we are at the tomb, and Jesus is laid to rest. So I will end my Good Friday Passion Narratives Reflections with that. There is so much. Uh, it's not my intention to try to uh, ram it down your throats. I beg your pardons. I beg your pardon and your indulgences if that is the way it comes across. Uh, please, no. But I, I have given you a good bit to reflect on, and I have focused mainly on the gospel according to Saint John because it is a good bit of what John is. A good part of this, my dear friends, is I have suggested to you read the suffering servant songs from Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and then 52 to 53. You will see it. It's easy the moment you open. From 42, the first verses, 49, likewise, 50, the first verses also likewise, and then from 52, so read on the Passion Sunday, and you can see it through. And maybe that is what you can read as you are at the tomb of Jesus. I end my reflections there and we will move to our some of my thoughts that I'd like to give you for the Easter vigil. Thank you, my dear friends. <music>